thanks a lot for uh, joining this uh, joint event uh, organized together with uh, Tommaso Valletti. Uh, so this is the first event organized by the Media Plurality uh, Research Policy Network of uh, the CEPR, and we are very glad uh, to do it together uh, with the Competition uh, Policy uh, RPN uh, of, the, of the CEPR. Uh, the goal of the uh, media plurality uh, RPN is to rethink uh, media regulation and in particular to study uh, the changes in media competition in, in, uh, in, uh, in recent years and to understand better uh, what can be done in the, in the future. For that, uh, members of the network are key act actors and in particular researchers that are specialized in, uh, in media economics and some of them are like joining today either as uh, participants i, I see like uh, matia here andrea or as speakers uh, during uh, today's uh, event and also to have with us also policy makers uh, to improve our uh, understanding of uh, media regulation and media competition so i'm very glad to uh, open this uh, this event and i think that uh, tomaso is going to uh, introduce it great thank you julia hello everybody it's a great pleasure of having our two RPNs doing a joint event, media plurality and competition policy. The event today is structured in two parts, which is also the nature of, of our research policy networks. We are trying really to have a discussion between academics and policymakers. So it's great that the academics can show the type of research they're currently doing and the policymakers are going to listen to them. And at the same time, the policymakers are going to tell us whether the research we do is relevant or what instead should still be understood. The topic for today is media bargaining codes. So there is these negotiations between the big tech platforms and the content producers that uh, there is a kind of a synergy there, but we also know that historically, since uh, the media platforms have become very successful, the Google, the Facebook of this world, this has drained resources away from traditional media. So there is uh, lots of uh, competition problems, lots of uh, political economy problems. Um, a couple of... Uh, um, practical things if people have questions for any one of the speakers there is a q a function secondly the the session is being recorded and the video will be made available in a couple of days on the website of cepr and uh, i also should say on the website you will find all, all our disclosures it's important that, that we disclose it if there is any conflict of interest as far as the first session is concerned you will see it online but there is no conflict of interest for any one of the participants so uh the the session is starts officially now with the academic side first there are two main papers one by uh, Marita Freeman um, from the Catholic University in Leuven, and which is an empirical paper on the Australian experience. And you will see also how academics sometimes struggle to find data, and that's the best we can do by scraping the web. And then there is going to be Robert, who's going to present instead a theoretical framework to think about the problem. And finally, Charles, Charles Angelucci from Sloan School MIT, will discuss both papers. So without further ado, uh, we will start with Marita. Thank you so much, Tommaso. Uh, hello, everyone. Very excited to for the opportunity uh, to present today. So thanks so very much to the organizers for that. Uh, so as Tommaso said, I will be presenting an empirical paper on the effect of the uh, Australian news media bargaining code on how content is displayed on one of the affected platforms, in this case, the Google News aggregator. Uh, so the very, very broad motivation that drives this project is that, as we all know, the digital platforms are central to our economy, but there's still a lot of debate going on about the right tools to regulate them. And so more specifically here, I focus on one policy issue, is, which is how large platforms can leverage their market power when they negotiate with their suppliers to appropriate a disproportionate amount of these jointly generated stories. And of course, this is a particular concern if the weaker party, as is the case with news media companies, generates a sort of a social benefit. Um, so more, even more specifically here, I look at this particular regulatory response by the Australian government, where they passed this regulation mandating platforms to bargain with news content providers, where the idea was that they improve the negotiation power, the negotiation position, negotiation position of the uh, news media companies um, in order to enable them to redistribute the surplus. Um, and the 
the specific sort of aspect of this uh, regulation that I look at in this study is how uh, a kind of an unintended consequence of this regulation, which is how it affected the relative cost of different types of content to the platform, which then also led to changes in how this content is displayed or what type of content gets prioritized versus deprioritized on this platform. Uh, but before I dive deeper into that, I wanted to just uh, in a few uh, few points just tell about what is the sort of the general idea of this regulation and the general appeal of it, which is that it releverages private information of the bargaining parties while also strengthening the weaker party. And sort of this, I would say, is particularly so leveraging this private information of the bargaining parties is particularly important in digital markets because we have many, many highly heterogeneous goods in these markets and the prices are often not observable or zero uh, towards the consumers, which is why what puts the regulators a particular informational disadvantage. Um, then the other thing that this regulation does is it strengthens the weaker party by uh, first, so requiring the bargaining parties to come to an agreement within a fixed time frame, but if they don't manage to do so, they're all both asked to submit a final offer to an arbitrator panel, which then gets to choose one of the two um, offers. And the idea here is that this kind of introduces uncertainty with regards to which of the deals is going to be, or which of the offers is to be chosen, which should then incentivize negotiated deals in the first place, and also sort of more reasonable offers if this bargaining stage is nevertheless reached. And so the reason why these kind of regulations have currently focused on the news industry is, as we, as I already mentioned, is because the news industry provides an important social good in, in form of um, quality media that then uh, ensure well-informed, knowledgeable society, uh, keeps politicians accountable, etc. But the issue is that the news industry, as we know, has been struggling financially in the past decades, not least because of this general shift from print to online news, and then the general consumer unwillingness to pay for online news, which has led to sort of or reinforced the reliance on online advertising by newspapers, which is itself is a highly concentrated industry. So here, the idea of this regulation is that currently or prior to any such regulation, these kind of aggregated platforms such as Google and Facebook were able to display news without compensating the publishers for it. But this kind of mandated bargaining regulation enforces these kind of payments or transfers to the publishers that would hopefully alleviate these financial pressures of the um, news media industry and therefore hopefully ensure the continued provision of the quality journalism. So, Australia is the one country where this kind of regulation exists already since, well, two years ago. Uh, but there's actually, as uh, Tomas already mentioned, there's a number of other countries that are considering implementing similar regulations, including Canada, which to my understanding is farthest in the process in implementing similar regulation, but also, for example, the US, where uh, a comparable regulation was recently reintroduced in the Senate just three days ago. And this, to me, just further underscores the importance to understanding the full range of consequences of the Australian bargaining code, which then leads me to my research question that I ask here, which is what happens to content on Google News once Google has to start paying for news? And I also want to already give you a bit of a preview of this findings, and that is that I indeed find that there's a significant effect on the content displayed by the Google News algorithm, and in particular, uh, it appears that the larger foreign news publishers seem to gain share uh, shares of content displayed on the on the uh, on the Google News, whereas the domestic publishers seem to lose, and this is likely because of this kind of. Uh, change in the relative cost of one type of content versus the other for Google. And also intuitively, we generally observe more substitution where there are more alternatives available, such as in global news topics rather than in domestic Australian news topics. Um, so then I also want to briefly introduce the, uh, the relevant points of the specific regulation of the Australian mandatory news media bargaining code, which is uh, competition law based regulation, which was developed to target uh, dominant platforms in general, but sort of had specifically Google and Facebook in mind. 
And so this uh, regulation was enacted in March 2021, so like two years ago. But actually, interestingly, it does not formally yet apply. So this means that no platform has been designated to be subject to this regulation. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, so it seems that this threat of being subject to this regulation has been sufficient for both Google and Facebook to conclude a large number of deals with publishers in Australia. In the case of Google, this is virtually all publishers. Uh, in Australia, so more than 30 deals with both individual publishers and groups of publishers. Um, so I also want to say a few things about whom this regulation applies to on the side of the news websites. And so in general, this regulation targets newspapers or news publishers to target the Australian market. And this is for the simple reason that these are the publishers that fall under the jurisdiction of the Australian government. And this will, I will explain in more detail in a, in a little while, but uh, this will just lead to my first hypothesis, which is that we might expect some substitution from away from the domestic publishers towards the foreign publishers, because Google still doesn't have to pay for the content from the foreign publishers. There's also a minimum turnover threshold uh, for to be able to negotiate with either Google or Facebook. And this will contribute to my second hypothesis, which is that we might observe some substitution from larger domestic publishers towards the smaller domestic publishers. And finally, um, this regulation supposedly applies to news as kind of like general interest to Australians, which in general is like a very broad, and the regulation is defined very broadly. But what I do is I focus on sort of current news events, both domestically and internationally, rather than something like entertainment or sports news. Um, so because I, as I mentioned, in part because as I mentioned, this regulation does not formally apply, um, but also for other reasons, we don't actually know that much about the specific licensing deals. But what we do know is that the total amount of these deals is substantial and it, it's said to be over 200 million Australian dollars a year from both Google and Facebook to the Australian news publishers. And just to give you an intuition of this, this amounts to about or corresponds to about 20% of uh, journalist salaries in Australia. So this is uh, what we know about the overall volume of the deals. But then when it comes to individual deals, what we know is that you could say that they kind of broadly fall into two categories in that the smaller publishers seem to have received more sort of lump sum offers that are based on some sort of formula based on the audience size, the volume of content, things like that. Whereas the larger publishers seem to have been able to negotiate customized offers, including, for example, things like ad revenue sharing, which kind of suggests that there is to, to the larger publishers, there's a component to the deals that is a function of the volume of the content displayed. Which then leads me to my second hypothesis, which is that there might be some substitution away from these larger publishers towards these smaller publishers. And just to summarize this, uh, so based on these kind of changes in the relative pricing of the different content, based on what we know about the regulation and the deals, uh, so I expect two things to likely happen. And one is that there might be some substitution away from the domestic content to the foreign content, and also away from larger domestic news websites because the reimbursement of those varies with the content volume towards the smaller publishers. But of course, uh, any such substitution would be limited by the availability of reasonable, appropriate substitutes. And so just to conclude the part on the regulation, um, I just want to show you an example of why I think something like this might really be happening. And it's because, for example, even prior to the regulation, Google already experimented with this algorithm in Australia very much in the same way that I just talked about. So here you have an example of the same search terms. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you have all the standard Australian publishers. Uh, so the Australian Financial Review, Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian version. On the right-hand side, you have in part one foreign publisher and also two smaller publishers, so very much what we just talked about. So very briefly, I just want to tell you exactly what uh, Tommaso already referred to. So what I do is I scrape data and I scrape data from the Google News aggregator from the front page for about eight months before and after the regulation. So from the time when the plan 
to implement this regulation was announced. So I gather all the data that you can access on Google News directly. And then the one thing I add to this data is the country of the news publishers in order to be able to do this analysis comparing the effect on the foreign versus domestic publishers. And just one more thing I want to say about the data itself. So I guess unsurprisingly, the distribution of the articles is highly skewed. So we have a few large publishers that appear in the data every day, every sort of iteration when I scrape the data. Then there's a sort of a bit of a longer tail of smaller publishers, and then there's a very, very long tail of very small publishers. And then here I also have highlighted um, the foreign publishers with these green rectangles, just to show you that about 15% of the articles come from foreign publishers, which just kind of suggests that there's room for some substitution, perhaps. Um, yes, so the empirical approach I take is a difference in difference analysis. And before I, um, before I show the specific re re regression specification that I estimate, I just wanted to kind of more informally uh, explain how I think about why I choose New Zealand or publishers in New Zealand, respectively South Africa as the control group. And that's in part because, so similar to Australia, the news on Google News in these two countries are largely domestic. So about 85% also there are domestic. And then also the composition of the foreign news is similar to Australia, that those in Australia, as in that most of them come from UK and the US. But perhaps more importantly, uh, there's no upcoming regulation of a similar type in New Zealand or South Africa during the period studied here, which is, for example, the reason why I wasn't able to use Canada here, uh, because they were already discussing this regulation there. Uh, so here we have the regression that I estimate. And so here, please bear with me for a moment. Uh, so the outcome I look at in the main results is the article share per country and publisher. In the robustness checks, I also look at the article count. Then this here is the, um, the treatment effect. But as I already mentioned, based on these two hypotheses, I actually don't expect there to be a homogeneous effect on all the publishers in Australia after the treatment, nor I expect there to be a homogeneous effect on the domestic publishers in Australia after the treatment. Instead, um, what I would expect based on what, what I just presented is that there would be a positive effect on the foreign publishers and then a negative effect on the uh, domestic news publishers uh, and in this case, I sort of it's interacted with the market share because it's sort of likely that there's this substitution from the smaller to the larger publishers or from the larger to the smaller publishers. Um, yes, and of course, there's a number of assumptions we need to make to say that, the, that these estimates are valid. But most importantly, I just want to show you that the parallel pretrends are there. Uh, and in this case, this is New Zealand and in general, also because there's high volatility in this kind of data, I aggregate for this, I aggregate the data on a monthly level. And then for South Africa, maybe it doesn't look as great, but it's still sort of on average seems to hold. Um, so that's, um, yes, so that's the, now we're getting to the results. And so sort of the main results, um, and for the main results, I just aggregate my data across all the articles in headlines, which is sort of general current news topics and world or sort of global news and Australian domestic news. And indeed, we don't see that the effect, uh, the overall effect on, on all publishers or all, all domestic publishers is significant. But indeed, we instead we see that there is this positive effect on um, foreign news websites where you have about like a one third of a percent point increase per each 1% pre-treatment market share. And then you have this negative the countering effect for the domestic publishers where the net it's about a small sort of 0.03 to 0.09 percentage point decrease per each pre-treatment, 1% of pre-treatment share. Um, just to make these results more intuitive, I wanted to share one heterogeneity analysis here which is I just split the sample and only look at these global news topics versus Australian news. And here, 
Um, and in global news topics, as you can see, we have a lot more websites in the sample as compared to the domestic news. And we also see that intuitively there is more substitution in the global news topics than in domestic news. And that uh, in the global news, there's the effect is larger than in the overall sample, whereas in Australian news, the effect is actually not significant. Um, then I also, of course, run a set of robustness checks, but here actually, I think there's just one that I wanted to show you that just to show that this, this results kind of uh, move intuitively. And that's, um, I aggregate in one of these robustness checks, I aggregate the data by the ownership of publishers. And the idea here is that the negotiations actually take, so that's the level at which negotiations with Google actually take place. And uh, sort of the reassuring result we see here is that the effect here uh, on the domestic publishers is even larger now that we aggregate per uh, owner, and it's also more precisely estimated. Uh, so uh, that's the sort of result, set of results I wanted to share today. So that I just wanted to briefly conclude, and hopefully I've so I've tried to convince you that here I provide some co causal evidence on that this kind of regulation has affected which content is displayed. And also for me, there are two main takeaways. And one is that uh, Google seems as a gatekeeper in its role as a gatekeeper, it seems to have some ability to substitute towards less expensive content, but it nevertheless uh, seems to be constrained by consumer demand by available substitutes. And my other takeaway would be that if we would mandate lump sum payments and if uh, if more, if there was coordination across jurisdictions or simply if more of these countries that are planning to implement similar regulations would do, do that, then we would further limit the ability of the platform to, uh, to alter the ranking. So I think that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marita. Well, that was excellent. There's already a question for you from the audience. You may want to answer by typing or later on if there is time. It's about the impact on journalism. These rents, are they just kept by the shareholders of basically by Murdoch or does it go to the journalist? But uh, I'll go the, word, the floor now to Robert, Robert Smoji. You're going to be next and discuss about a theoretical framework to think about this very same problem. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present this paper, which is a joint work with Luca Sandrini and uh, titled News Media Bargaining Codes. Um, so I'm in the lucky situation that Marita has just explained to you most of what you need to do about news media bargaining codes. So I would just like to highlight one uh, additional aspect that is important to motivate our uh, modeling choices. So, um, the news media bargaining code in Australia works uh, that if a platform is uh, designated uh, by the authorities, it should uh, it must start conducting good faith negotiations with news publishers. If these negotiations fail, then there is final offer arbitration, and there is uh, quite an important provision. Uh, the arbitration panel can actually deviate from these two final offers if I quote. Uh, each final offer is not in the public interest. We think that this mechanism is very important. It uh, constitutes a um, credible threat. Uh, sorry, a, a credible threat. Um, this is why the regulation has a bite, and uh, this ensures uh, that at the end of the day, there will be a monetary payment, a monetary transfer from the digital platforms to the news publishers either because, uh, as it seems to be the case in Australia right now, as Marita mentioned, the threat of being designated is enough that there is a payment, or one of the three stages of uh, this process will result in a payment. I'm telling you all this because uh, this is how we model news media bargaining codes. We model them as a transfer from the digital platforms to the news publishers. So we sort of take this high level view of trying to assess um, the effect of such a transfer on, uh, the, on social welfare. So we abstract away from the details of bargaining and um, you will see some of our results will be about how to optimally design uh, a news media bargaining code and how to optimally design a transfer uh, when, um, so you can interpret this transfer very explicitly 
uh, if uh, we are in the search stage of the Australian code and this provision kicks in. Otherwise, you can interpret this transfer uh, as you know helping the regulators to assess if an offer is in the public interest. Okay, so uh, what we do in this paper is we build a theoretical model of the news market to analyze the welfare effects of news media bargaining codes. To do so, we design a model that satisfies four desirable properties. First, uh, news websites and social media platforms are in competition to attract advertising. Um, so I will uh, have this uh, slight abuse of terminology when I mention social media platforms, just think about Google and uh, Facebook. Second, uh, we assume that the social media platform has a higher advertising efficiency. This is because they have more data, uh, they can be better target consumers, and so they have a higher click-through rate. Third, uh, it is the news website which is the content creator. And uh, importantly, the news website can actually reach consumers through posting its content on the social media platform. And fourth, Consumers actually value additional news creation. And so uh, additional news creation actually increases the user's value of joining the social media platform as well. And as usual in this literature, we uh, assume that uh, users dislike advertising. So let me tell you about uh, the core mechanism in our paper and uh, let me give you a preview of the results. So what happens is that if an advertiser places an ad on the news website, this creates a positive externality. This is because if they have more ad revenue, they can use it to create additional news content. This additional news content is valued by consumers, so it increases consumer surplus, which uh, leads to more participation uh, on the social media platform as well, which uh, increases the profit of the social media platform. But if you put your sh yourself in the shoes of an advertiser, uh, there is a there is a trade off. Uh, placing ads on the news website uh, uh, has this positive indirect benefit from increasing uh, the reach by more participation, as I just explained to you. But there is also a direct loss from using the news website for advertising, which is the lower efficiency channel instead of uh, going to advertise on the social media platform. So because of this, uh, advertisers do not fully internalize the positive externality, which generally leads to a socially suboptimal level of news creation, which is a market failure, which tells us that there is room for policy intervention and policy intervention such as the news media bargaining codes. And our main result is that it is always possible to design news media bargaining codes that improve total welfare without harming consumers, also without harming advertisers, only the social media platform may be worse off, but this is not unintended because we are talking about the regulation that makes the social media platform pay. All right, so I will show you the simplest possible setup and I will have time for one uh, extension. So in order to understand this market, one must have four different types of players. So we will have consumers, and in a simple setup, just one advertiser, one news website, and one social media platform. The consumer's utility function is, as you can see on the slides, with V denoting the value of user-generated content uh, on the social media uh, platform, D measuring the negative externality exerted by advertisement levels uh, AI, where SM throughout this talk will denote the social media platform, and NW will denote uh, the news websites. And so, so far, this is very standard. The interesting effect comes in in the search term of the utility of the consumers. F actually describes how much consumers value additional news creation. Because we assume in this simple version that, that the value of news is either high if there is additional news creation or low. If it is high, we denote it by F. So this is a key parameter in our model. If it is low, we normalize it to zero. And in this baseline setup, this F is exogenously given. The only ex, um, extension I will have time to show you will be endogenizing this F. And so importantly, we, are, as, um, we assume that advertising revenue allows the news website to create additional news. So whenever there are there is positive uh, there's a positive level of advertisement on the news website. Users benefit from additional news creation. 
otherwise they don't. Okay, some additional assumptions. For simplicity, the social media platform displays all news content. Um, users can choose to consume news directly on the news website, or they can go on the social media platform like Facebook, and uh, then we assume that they are redirected to the news website and read the news there. So this is kind of a generous view toward the social media platform, not very realistic. We have an extension where it is more realistic, but we think this is a generous view because it doesn't take into account the business stealing effect, but it goes against our main results because we find that the regulation that makes the social media pay is welfare increasing even in, in this setup. All right, so the number of users is endogenous and for simplicity linearly increasing in their utility. The general profit function is simply the product of the number of users times uh, the level of advertisement they can attract times the price per ad per person uh, paid by the advertiser. The advertiser's profit function is also the product of the number of users times the number of uh, the, the level of advertisement it can attract times the difference between the returns on ad per person of the channel minus the price. So this uh, return on ad per person is what we call advertising efficiency. And uh, this is how we model uh, the, the assumption that the social media channel is more efficient. KSM is strictly larger than KNW, uh, meaning that for a given number of consumers, given ad levels, given prices, the advertisement, advertiser would prefer to use the social media channel. And the restrictive assumption, but only in this talk, we have an extension to, to uh, to um, relax it is that advertiser single home, which means that they put all their advertisement either on the social media site or on the news website. Uh, just to recap, uh, this is how our market looks like. So social media platform and the news website is in competition to attract advertising revenue. Uh, the news website posts uh, their news on the social media and they are both two-sided platforms that connect advertisers to consumers. Uh, and to complete the description of the model, I have to tell you about timing. In, in the first stage, the channels compete in prices to attract advertisement. In a second stage, uh, the advertiser chooses where to allocate the ads and how much to allocate there. And third, uh, consumers observe everything and decide whether to join the platform or not. All right, so the first results are about the less safer equilibrium uh, without the regulation, which we use as a benchmark. Uh, to compare the effects of regulation. So we find that in the less safer equilibrium, if the value of news creation is low, then the advertiser allocates all its ads to the social media. This is uh, quite intuitive because, uh, well, if uh, consumers don't value news very much, then the advertiser uh, goes for the higher efficiency advertising channel, which is the social media. Vice versa, if the level of news creation is uh, sufficiently large above a well-defined threshold, then the advertiser will allocate all the ads to the news website, benefiting from the indirect uh, benefit of a larger reach. And now finally, I can tell you how we model news media bargaining codes. So we model them as a regulation with mon that mandates a monetary transfer to be paid from the social media platform to the news website. It must be paid in uh, stage zero before the whole game I showed you unfolds so that uh, uh, all the actors can react to it. And very importantly, um, uh, the news media bargaining code uh, allows the news website to create additional news, even if all the ads are allocated to the social media site. So this is how uh, the regulation is intended. Uh, we define total welfare in a very standard way uh, as the sum of consumer surplus, the profit of the advertiser, the profit of the news website, and the profit of the social media platform. And we get to our first main result compared to the less safer situation. The news media bargaining code increases total welfare without harming consumers. So in, the intuition is that, uh, well, we have these two regimes. If consumers do not value news very much, then uh, recall that uh, without the regulation, there is no additional news creation because uh, the news website doesn't get any uh, revenues it could use to create additional news. Now, thanks to uh, the news media bargaining code, thanks to the transfer, now there is news creation, which increases consumer surplus and total welfare. Uh, if we are in the other regime, 
So whenever consumers value news uh, a lot, then there is also a welfare gain. And this welfare gain comes from um, the advertiser actually using the higher efficiency advertising channel, which is the social media. So in a sense, we are in the best of both words scenario, thanks to the news media bargaining code. And we can show that the consumers and the advertiser is also weakly better off. Uh, the social media is potentially harmed, but again, this is not unintended. Um, all right, so as I promised, I have time for one extension. I will show you what happens if uh, the news website can choose uh, its news quality endogenously. Um, so it can make, uh, what happens if it can make a costly investment in creating news? Uh, assume for simplicity quadratic news. So in our game, we will have a new stage, uh, stage three, where the news website chooses news quality. We believe this is the most uh, realistic timing because it allows the news website to react to uh, the news media bargaining code, so this transfer scheme, if there is any in place, and it can also react to the allocation of advertising. But we have an extension where we talk about the different timing. So, result, uh, we find that in the less safer equilibrium, um, if the cost of news creation is sufficiently low, then the advertiser will allocate its ads to the news website, and the equilibrium level of news creation will be positive. Not very surprisingly, if the cost of news creation C is high, then the advertiser will allocate its ads to the social media, and there won't be additional news creation in equilibrium. So we come to our second main result, and uh, this is by comparing the equilibrium level of uh, news quality to the news quality that maximizes total welfare. And we find that in the less safer regime, the equilibrium level of news creation is always socially suboptimal. And we believe this is important because it shows us that there is a market failure um, caused by uh, the positive externality not being fully internalized. And it means that there is room for policy interventions such as the news media bargaining codes. So uh, under endogenous news quality, we compare two designs for uh, news media bargaining codes. We compare lump sum transfers and transfers which are, which are proportional to news quality F. Uh, so first with a lump sum transfer, we find that generally such a transfer is ineffective in the sense that it leaves welfare unchanged, which means that uh, potentially it can backfire if the cost of introducing the regulation is high. So our reading of, the, of this result is that, um, well, a poorly designed regulation can backfire, which is not very surprising. On a more positive note, we come to our third main result. We can show that uh, a transfer which is proportional to news quality uh, leads to more news creation and higher consumer surplus compared to both the lump sum transfer and also compared to the less safer regime, which means that it is always possible to design a welfare improving news media bargaining codes and it also tells us that uh, when thinking about the design, it is preferable to try to somehow tie the level of transfers to the quality of news. All right, um, we have a list of extensions, the raw access checks I don't have time uh, to go into. I also don't have time for the related literature. So let me conclude. Uh, we analyze the welfare effects of news media bargaining codes. Um, because positive externality from additional news creation is not fully inter, uh, internalized, the equilibrium level of news production may be suboptimal. And we find that the news media bargaining codes can help to resolve this problem. They never harm consumers. There is, it, they are always possible to design it in a way that, are, that is welfare improving. They may, may only harm the social media platform. Of course, uh, our study has a number of limitations. For example, we consider one single news website. On one hand, we don't think this is very problematic uh, concerning our main results because more competition would just uh, make the news websites uh, probably be worse off and more in even more needed financing. On the other hand, it is unfortunate because we cannot have heterogeneous news websites, which means we cannot have the substitution effect that Marita uncovered. Um, there are a couple of uh, aspects of the news media bargaining codes that we have started working on, but it's very early stage. And of course, uh, there are important empirical challenges of estimating parameters and the cost of regulations that we, we don't have much to say about in this paper. 
So this is it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Robert. That was very interesting and very sharp. Let me remind the audience, if you have any question for our speakers, please use the, the Q&A function. Marita has already answered one question in the, in the Q&A function, and she's uh, typing her second answer, I see, as we speak. But if you also have a question for Robert, please do use that. But now I'm going to pass it on to Charles, Charles Angelucci, for a discussion. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you to uh, Julia and Tommaso for asking me to join this panel. I was very happy to read this. Uh, so, you know, two super interesting papers on a massively important uh, topic. We just saw a theoretical paper and an empirical one. So what I'll do during my uh, time is that I'll offer some comments about both papers and then I'll discuss some possible future directions uh, in, terms of, in terms of research. All right, so let me start with the, um, the, one we, the, the paper we just saw by Robert, the theoretical one. I thought it was very nice exercise i really enjoyed it i think the uh you know they basically managed to write a model that's tractable which as a lot of many of us know is not is not easy so i just want to, to say this now in terms of the comments um i had some thoughts which are really more about potential additional work more than fix, fixing things in, in this paper so one thing is uh, as robert showed us the transfer t made from the social media to the news producer is really kind of exogenous to the analysis. It's chosen, implicitly chosen by some uh, regulator above, above the players. Now, you could argue that this is kind of, that goes against the spirit of the data bargaining code, which kind of takes the opposite view, which is that I'm the regulator. I actually don't have enough information to regulate. So what I'll do is that I'll design some kind of bargaining, decentralized bargaining protocol, and I'll let the players uh, hopefully come Come, come to a, to an agreement. Okay, so in some sense, this paper, you know, because it has to be tractable, bypasses the, I would argue, something which is equally important, which is how to actually design this bargaining protocol so that it delivers on on the objective of uh, of the of the regulator. Now, what this paper does do, though, is that it shows that there is hope because it shows that there is a range of values for T such that social welfare is higher, actually it shows something stronger. It shows that there is a range of values such that T is Pareto improving. It makes everyone uh, worse off, which means that there is hope for the parties to come to an agreement if they were fully uh, allowed to, in the model, allowed to, to negotiate, to come to an agreement. All right. So in terms of, um, I guess, another comment about the modeling, but also the real, the real world really is that usually economists don't think that lump sum transfers provide uh, much much incentives. They're really all about uh, redistribution. Traditionally, newspapers derived a lot of their revenues from advertising, and that of course had a direct impact on their marginal incentives to produce uh, content. You know, within the realm narrow realm of an econ model, a lump sum transfer is not gonna gonna work. In the model, it works almost kind of by assumption because at least in the baseline setting, because it's assumed that as soon as a dollar is transferred from the social media to the news producer, then the news producer can produce high content. In an, in an uh, extension, which Robert just showed us, this is, this is not true. So I was thinking uh, about that now, beyond the paper, in reality, what, what, this, you know, what should happen is that these lumps and transfers are periodically renegotiated, okay? So this is gonna be something kind of relational. So I guess I'm invoking some kind of repeated game uh, logic to this. And so I think my conclusion was that the fact that these transfers are lump sum might not be so much of an issue uh, if we think of them as a, as a, the outcome of a repeated game kind of uh, dynamic. All right. Now, one, um, one comment on one of the extensions that Robert presented. In one of the extensions, uh, actually precisely to address the problem I just raised, um, Robert and you know they allow basically for the transfer made by the social media to the news producer to be contingent on the quality of the news that the news producer produces. And I don't know if I really, I don't know how to think about this because I think measuring news quality is extremely complicated for anyone, researchers, practitioners, et cetera. I just don't know what it means in the real world for the parties to, to be able to negotiate on transfers that are contingent on quality. I mean, for all we know, 
the social media and the news producers might have different definitions of what quality of the news means. Okay, so I guess a comment to Robert and uh, would be to think more about how one would implement this. Okay, but you know, great paper. So on to the next. Uh, empirical paper, I also really, really enjoyed reading it. I think this is, you know, it's a simple, clean uh, empirical design that makes one very important point that, you know, once you learn about it, you're like, oh yeah, of course this is, this is going to happen, uh, but you weren't thinking about it, but we weren't thinking about it before that, which is that news bargaining codes are going to affect the news that people are given to read on the news aggregators for the obvious observation that news bargaining codes are going to change the relative prices that news aggregators face when negotiating with various uh, news producers. So in terms of comments about this paper, um, so I know, Marita, that I think my understanding is that you scraped kind of the top of the news, the most important news uh, when you go into Google News. I was wondering if maybe this is just too much work, but is there any evidence of substitution from higher quality to lower quality um, types of news, okay? I think if you focus your attention on the top news, you might not be able to detect anything. But if you go down the ranking, you know, down the ranking of news by importance, maybe there is more room for, for Google News to, to, to maneuver there and just switch to cheaper and, and also unfortunately lower quality uh, news. Something that might be interesting to look at is also whether the news bargaining code affected, so on the supply side, whether it affected the incentives that new news producers had in terms of what news to produce. Now, you know, I basically want to become unique because I don't want to be substitutable. So does this happen? Do I, do I choose, do I now focus more of my attention on topics that are gonna be harder for um, Google News to find elsewhere? I guess two two final comments about, about the paper. One is, do you know if there is any way to check whether people starting, started using Google News a little less after the introduction of the policy? Uh, after all, if Google News was maximizing, optimizing, and maximizing consumer engagement, once they're forced to change the types of news they show to consumers, we should we should see a fall in demand, although I would expect it would be very small. And I guess the last point that's a very minor one is that Google News provides personalized news. Of course, the way you collected the data, you couldn't do that. So I, I just I was just curious if you had any thought about whether that kind of uh, should change some of our, the, you know, some of the conclusions we draw from your results. All right, in the time I have left, let me check time. Let me discuss. Okay, so I was also thinking about possible future directions in terms of research, and I think there's a lot of exciting. Um, things that one could do, both in theory, I mean theory work, and both empirically and within empirics, applied, reduced form, and uh, but and also structural, I would think. So let's let me start with the theory. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the idea behind the news bargaining code is that the regulator lacks, you know, appropriate information to regulate the players directly. Now that it. Historically, it has not been a, so much of a problem for regulation. In fact, there's a whole field in economics, which is all about that. It's magazine design. So I was, I was thinking that this is a research topic and a framework that really lends itself to writing a very nice, you know, old school mechanism design uh, paper. The fact that information is decentralized is not a problem. In, if anything, you could say that it's less of a problem compared to other settings because information is shared by multiple parties. And so that usually, you know, for the nerds amongst us, as we know, that makes it easier to elicit information from, from, from the players. So I think there would be advantages to, I mean, something interesting is that it would force us to think clearly about what the objective of the news bargaining code is. If we write down the mechanism design problem, we need to have an objective in mind. And this is, I'm making this comment because I find the objective of the news bargaining code to be a little vague. Okay, so this has nothing to do with the papers we saw. I'm talking about the regulator here. They just talk about fair compensation and helping journalism because it's struggling. This is all good, but it's very vague. Okay, so if we if we had to write down a maximum design paper, we would have to be much more, we would have we would need clearer ideas about what, what it is that we're trying to achieve here. What 
would be interesting to see, of course, what the optimal mechanism looks like and how you can actually implement it in practice. And does is it the case that the optimal mechanism can be implemented through some kind of decentralized bargaining the way that the Australians uh, do it? Okay. Now, I conjecture that it's unlikely to be the case because this is an environment where, so in the real world policy is one in which negotiations are purely bilateral, if I understood correctly, right? So it's between Google News and Associated Press, and then there's another negotiation between Google News and say, the New York Times. But this is an environment with deep externalities. So the agreement that Google News enters with uh, the Associated Press has an impact on the other agreements that Google News is currently uh, negotiating with the other producers. So I, I conjecture that it's unlikely that the optimal mechanism would specify purely bilateral um, bargaining. All right, next, I'm running out of time. More empirical work, I think, so building on this idea that I just said, which is that this is an environment with interdependencies and externalities across pairs of players. There is a work, there is a field in IO actually, the structural IO that um, has developed the tools to study uh, this. And this is, I'm referring to the Nash and Nash literature, which usually looks at bargaining between health insurance plans and hospitals. That would be a kind of the canonical uh, application of that literature. Now, with the right data, and I should insist on this, these are very data intense uh, papers to write. You could imagine uh, counterfactual scenarios that I think would be interesting. In particular, one would be what would happen if we allow the news producers, producers to collectively negotiate with um, the news aggregators as opposed to doing it on a one-to-one -one basis, okay? So that that's an invitation for more structural work, adopting Nash and Nash uh, tools. All right, and the last thing I have to say is that I looked around and I talked to some colleagues and it, it kind of occurred to me that there isn't that much empirical evidence about the impact of news aggregators on the way people consume the news, okay? If I am wrong, please, of course, uh, tell me. And probably the reason for that is because we need micro data. So we need like, you know, web browsing data and this is just very hard to get. But we actually don't know if news aggregators have made people say less loyal to news outlets or if it leads to people being exposed to more or less uh, topics or if it makes people better informed. And although this is not exactly about news bargaining code, I would hope that we would want to know the answer to these questions when we're talking about optimal regulation. Okay, so I'm done. I think this is a really interesting uh, topic. I enjoyed reading these two papers and I think there's a lot more work that can be done both theoretically and, and, and empirically. That's great, Charles. That was exactly what uh, we wanted to hear from you. So comments to the papers, but also direction for future research, which is badly needed and very interesting. And we'll be also very interested in knowing how the regulators and the media people react to this. We still have a, a few minutes, five minutes. There is yet another question from Marita in the chat. But since we have, uh, as I said, five minutes, I would give, I think, the floor back first to Marita and then to Robert so they can have a, a couple of minutes each to react to some of the points that Charles made or whatever they wanted to, to say to conclude this first academic part of our seminar. Marita. Yes. Uh, so thank you so very much, Charles, for the comments. Um, my general reaction was that I think uh, indeed this, uh, at least most of the comments uh, should be possible to address. And actually that's something we're working on in future work. So specifically with regards to how, what's the effect on uh, of this regulation that was on the content on the Google News aggregator, but then maybe also how it might shape the quality of the content produced by the publishers overall. So that's something for the, that we're considering in the future work. Um, so with regards to this current project, so there indeed, so I haven't consider, considered personalized news, which is I think more of the sort of more common um, on uh, Google search as a platform, but then, then on Google news, you mainly have, you mainly have these like standardized uh, news that everybody gets irrespective of uh, uh, they access the news from. So, so I don't think it's a big concern there. And indeed, I mean, I, I really like your points for the uh, 
potential future research, uh, the the whole Nash and Nash uh, bargaining approach is something I very much would have taken like to take to this, or like in an extension, but that's been a bit of an issue in terms of uh, data availability, but definitely sort of focusing on the quality of news and and sort of how how these kind of aggregators shape news consumption is something that's definitely interesting for future research. I think that's what Thank I have to share. Like Thank you. And also, Robert, um, Charles alluded to, uh, as, as expected, to some contracting issues, maybe optimal mechanism design, so lots of things to think about. So so what's your first right. question? Right. So thanks a lot, Charles, for your comments. I think uh, I, I agree with both of them. Um, um, I also think that this information design approach that you have as a future research direction is great. Um, so about... Um, whether lump sum transfers can be effect, efficient or not. Um, I, I, this is exactly why we uh, tried this proportional, um, proportional transfers as a, as a shortcut of saying that, okay, if it's a lump sum transfer, there is this uh, take the money and run effect, which is not very realistic. But in, in reality, because of the repeated game aspect that, also, that you also picked up on, uh, we believe that, uh, well, okay, there's a lump sum transfer for two years, but news websites foresee that in two years there will be renegotiation. And if they sort of stop working or they uh, produce uh, very low quality news, then maybe they won't get, uh, won't get anything. But um, I agree that the subtleties of how to, how to measure quality is, uh, is a really tough question. But uh, yeah, thanks. Great, thank you, Robert. I'll thank again, Marita, Robert, and Charles for this first part. And I think, yes, we are one minute ahead of time and I will pass it to the next uh, session, which is involving policymakers and, uh, and industry people. So it's interesting to hear from them, how they react to what we do and what we are missing and what instead they learn from us. And I will give the floor now to the one and only one, Cristina Cafarra to moderate the next panel. Cristina. <laughs> Thank you, Tommaso. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm Christina Cafar. I'm the co-founder with Greg Crawford of this uh, competition policy RPN uh, in 2021, vice chair of the steering committee. Uh, my disclosure statement is on the CPR RPN side, but uh, for transparency, I've done work, as most of you know, <clears throat> adverse to Google and to Facebook. I've done work for News Corp and other uh, publishers, although I have not done consulting work specifically on this topic. Um, this topic, nonetheless, is very dear to my heart, and um, if there's time, I'll, I'll also mention how I've come indirectly to play some part in the uh, um, notion that we may think about final offer arbitration as one of the components of this code. But I think that this particular regulation is important. It's very much something that uh, uh, has attracted attention for some time. And indeed, Greg Crawford and I wrote an article on this in 2020 because it was so new, new and exciting. And the reason it is uh, uh, so new and exciting is that truly it is one of the most innovative regulatory interventions, in my view, of recent times. And innovative for multiple reasons. One is because it was I think the first to explicitly tackle the major imbalance uh, disparity in the bargaining power between platform owners and publishers, business that depend on them. It tackled very much the free riding issue, which was at the heart of that disparity. Uh, a single publisher doesn't need to be, um, needs to be on a platform, but the platform doesn't need a single publisher. And innovative also because uh, it does, and this is something that Marita, uh, uh, mentioned and others too, we mentioned in 2020, it does rely not on the regulator handing down a particular prescriptive way of how this is how you price, this is what you do, the terms that you adopt, but he's relying on the information that is privately held by the parties. And that is, is, is really uh, very interesting and important. And at the time we described it as decentralized, direct decentralized regulation very much. Now this is hugely innovative, but also hugely controversial. As we'll hear from this panel on policy, it was resisted tooth and nail by Google and Facebook. Um, and these uh, and, and, and the threats that were put forward were actually followed through in Australia with a showdown 
uh, on uh, content blackout by Facebook. There was also threats in the US, threats are underway in Canada. So it is pretty much unprecedented to see platforms threatening uh, sovereign governments in this way, which is a testimony to their enormous power and the implications they have for democracy. As a final point, I also want to mention that this is regulation which has not been uh, welcomed, welcome, of course, not just by the targets of the regulation, but uh, this has been controversial also in the public debate because a number of fairly seasoned tech writers reflecting the sentiment of the tech industry, Ben Thompson, Ben Evan, Cassie Newton's people who write on these things have been fairly unanimously opposed on grounds that there is no basis for a payment going from the platforms to publishers because the platforms actually produce value. This is their argument for the publishers, they drive engagement, and if anything, the payment should be the other way. The, the other way around. And uh, there, the argument was, well, if you, as a government, want to shake down these platforms, then be honest and treat it like a tax, say this is a tax on journalism, and describe it as such. Don't pretend that it is something spontaneous. I never understood this because, of course, it is regulation. It is regulation that proceeds from a view that we need to do something about the quality of journalism and the fact that the funding of quality journalism uh, is, is under threat. So I think uh, this is, uh, to my mind, a, a slightly bizarre objection because, of course, it is regulation. It's not a tax. It is a regulation that tries to uh, exploit this private information. Now, I want to uh, start by introducing the, the next speakers and be quiet for the rest of the, of the discussion. Um, I think we have some of the most uh, uh, really consequential people to talk about this who are at the center of the policy uh, development. Um, I'll briefly mention their name and then we'll introduce them more properly as we go along. Of course, Rod Sims needs no introduction. He was very many years the high profile chair of the ACCC, uh, now the National uh, Australian University, but still very much involved in the policy discussion last week. He got an award for lifetime achievement in DC, but for our purposes today, he's the main architect of the news bargain code, which was passed in Australia. Then we have Paul Deegan, who since 2021 is the president and CEO of News Media Canada, um, the national association that represents print and digital media, and heavily involved in the current discussion of the law uh, in parliament, in the, in the commons in Canada. Um, and, and last but not, but not least, that we have Louis Dreyfus, the chairman of the board of Le Monde, of course, top uh, French newspaper. And of course, Louis has been involved uh, uh, on the front line in the settlement that's been uh, reached in France with the platforms in 2022. And he'll talk about the different approach that uh, has been taken in France. So let's start from you, Rod. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to have you here. You are, of course, also the chair of the Competition Policy RPN, uh, so have uh, uh, multiple hats in this discussion. But for these purposes, I'd really like uh, you to describe uh, this project. Of course, it came out of the very celebrated 2019 ACCC platform inquiry report as one of the recommendations that was pursued with some urgency. Tell us how it came about, but more importantly, because we understand how it came about, how it is performing, uh, what are the outcomes? What's it looking like on the ground? Thank you. Thanks, Christina, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, chat to you all. I have to say I really enjoyed the research, so uh, thank you to the presenters. It's uh, always fascinating as a policymaker to uh, sit and hear um, people who haven't been involved in the policy then look at the the policy after the event and and make comments so so it was just just fascinating but some excellent research so thank you um as christina said um the inquiry uh we, we i mean when, in australia when the, the the government has the power to instruct the ACCC the competition and consumer Reg enforcer to to do an inquiry and when it does it therefore seeking recommendations. That's why it's asked the ACCC to do it. So our inquiry resulted in recommendations to government. So we didn't use existing competition law. 
we used our expertise to make rec recommendations and the government accepted those. One of the 23 recommendations was the news media bargaining code. Um, as Christina mentioned, uh, we had Google um, threatening to remove search and Facebook uh, took down news for about a week, uh, including taking down bushfire warnings when we had a bushfire, medical warnings when we had a COVID pandemic and a range of other things. Um, I think it's fair to say both Google and Facebook overplayed their hands. Uh, there was a big negative reaction against what they did um, or, or were threatening to do in the case of Google. Uh, the only upshot out of that was that the treasurer uh, entered into discussions with the chief executive of Google and of Facebook and the uh, in my view, there was a complete back down by Google and Facebook. They did achieve something that mattered to them, but didn't matter at all to the government or to me, uh, which was that um, uh, they seemed to have a massive fear of designation. Uh, I think because they felt that would help it be more rep replicated around the world. So they, uh, it was eventually said that if they went off and did deals quickly, they wouldn't be designated. They then went off and did deals quickly. Uh, and so I think we got deals done more quickly with the threat of designation than we would have had with the way we intended, which was deals would get done with the threat of arbitration. But whether they're threat of designation or threat of arbitration, the deals were all done pursuant to the news media bargaining code. And I know Google and Facebook have been known to say they're not covered by the code. In, in one sense, that's right. In another sense, of course, there was no way they would have done those deals without the code. So th that, that I think is clear. Um, I just thought I'd just address the logic of the code because someone said earlier that it's unclear what the reason for it was. It just had one objective and that was to uh, equal, equalize the mar bargaining power imbalance. That was its sole objective, nothing else. Um, we, I'm a strong adherent to the Tinbergen rule one policy instrument for one policy objective. Uh, the, the, the code was totally targeted at redressing the bargaining imbalance. As we all know, there's tons of, market, of bargaining power imbalances in our society, but we felt this was important to address because it involved journalism. And as has been said so far, journalism is so important for society. So its only objective was remedying the bargaining power imbalance. I should just add, you know, we didn't, we had no desire to regulate directly. I mean, if had we had more information, we wouldn't have done any more. Um, the lack of information only affected the form of arbitration because we didn't have any information. The media had no information. The arbitrators would have had no information. So we had to adopt rather than conventional arbitration, final offer arbitration, where the parties put in bids and you choose the best offer. So the arbitrators needed mm. some grounding because of the lack of information. But I, I emphasize again, we were never intending to regulate. Had we had all the information in the world, we would not have regulated. We wanted to get the parties to negotiate and we got the parties to negotiate. So our objective, rightly or wrongly, uh, was a narrow one and we achieved it. Uh, as has been said, uh, it was a negotiate arbitrate framework. Um, it involves uh, one in all in, so it's not a must carry regime, but if Google or Facebook want to show any news at all, then they must negotiate with all eligible media companies. And uh, if not successful in negotiation, there'd be arbitration. Now that's what would have happened had they been designated. As I say, they went off and did deals to avoid being designated. Um, the outcomes, uh, clearly well over $200 million. Uh, I made that estimate before some final deals were done. So it's certainly well over 200 million Australian dollars per year. Um, Google did deals with all eligible media companies. There's one or two that claim they're eligible that they haven't got a deal, but, um, uh, most media people think that most people in the media business think that Google did a deal with all the eligible media companies. Facebook did deals with media companies that probably employ about 
85, maybe 90% of all journalists. Um, so they didn't achieve that objective, but, but Google certainly did. Um, most parties negotiated on their own behalf. Uh, we had two sets of collective bargains with a lot of very small players. They were just too small to negotiate on their own, but it was up to them to decide whether they negotiate individually or collective, collectively, and all the parties made that choice. Now, just to address some of the uh, misinformation that sometimes borders on disinformation, um, uh, no doubt Mr Murdoch attracts uh, a range of views in terms of his newspaper reporting, and different people can have different views on that. Um, uh, but the idea that this is just about Murdoch or just about News Limited is, is uh, absurd. Um, it, it's uh, uh, just a complete misrepresentation, which does get picked up, uh, but it is irritating. Uh, news Limited is one of four main news media interests in Australia. Um, there's probably six or seven medium-sized ones, so four big ones, six or seven medium-sized ones, and a whole range of smaller ones. And as I say, Google did a deal with them all. Um, and in my view, the smaller ones got more money per journalist than the bigger ones. Of course, the bigger ones got more money. Of course, they provide more journalists and therefore more content. Uh, secondly, we deliberately did not want this to be a link tax. So had this gone to... That the legislation says you can only pay lump sum. We did not want it linked to content because we felt that ran a risk of bringing um, clickbait into the equation. Now, given they weren't designated, they could negotiate as they wanted to. Um, the other point that was made was, um, uh, you know, where did the money go? Well, again, um, uh, we um, uh, didn't insist on any transparency over that um, mm -hmm. deliberately. Um, uh, but you know, many media, many reporters, many journalists have been quoted as saying, "There's never been a better time to be in journalism in Australia." Uh, and also, there is work by the research, the Australia Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which is a left-leaning organisation. I don't think they'd mind me saying that. Um, uh, which uh, has done research on job ads and has concluded that there's been a large increase in job ads for journalists. We know the Guardian increased their workforce by 50% as a result of the deal they got. Uh, but, you know, different companies did different things. Some companies would argue that they were about to retrench more journalists and then they didn't. I mean, it's a very hard issue to work out what's done with the money. And frankly, even if you had to, if they were required to report on that, I think it'd be very hard to do much with the results. Um, a few other points that, um, I mean, many of the criticisms of the code, uh, shortcomings of the code uh, that have been stated imply that we had to make, you know, compromises and all sorts of things. Um, in my view, most of the criticisms are about things that we deliberately decided not to do. So we deliberately decided the deals would not be public. Uh, even if they'd gone to arbitration, the arbitration results were not to be public. That was in the legislation. Uh, we did that because our goal was to redress the bargaining imbalance. And if you address, redress the bargaining imbalance, uh, you, you, your counterfactual then is what if there wasn't any bargaining imbalance and people could do deals without a news media bargaining code? Well, you wouldn't know the results of the deals anyway. You certainly wouldn't require them to tell you what you did with the money. So um, it's, uh, it, as I say, quite deliberately uh, done the way it was done. That doesn't mean you can't criticise it. Go for it. But um, uh, th these were deliberate design choices. Um, just to finish up, uh, Paul's going to talk about what's happening in Canada, which is probably the closest follow on uh, to the news media bargaining code. As we all know, the JCPA in the US has just been reintroduced um, into the House. Uh, we'll see what happens to that. I've heard a range of views about its chances. Um, the UK has legislation 
uh, that would enable its special market status overall regulatory regime of digital platforms. If that goes through, then one of the first things they'll do will come, be come up with a code of conduct uh, in relation to news bargaining, which I suspect will look a fair bit like the Australian code. And uh, we know that Indonesia is quite advanced in this. Uh, I've certainly had calls with people in India, Brazil, Malaysia, who are interested. So where all that goes, I don't know. But the Canadian one is obviously the most interest, and that's what Paul is going to talk about. Um, so uh, the only, yeah, no, look, I think I'll leave it there and leave the rest to questions. I've looked at the clock and Christina gave me 12 minutes and 12 minutes are up. So I'll... Yeah, uh, it gave, it gave me time to run to a different room because my internet completely died. And so I had to just find a different location, but I heard most of what you said. But I want to pursue, before moving to Paul, there's something I want to pursue you on, Rod, which is you were particular in saying this is not uh, regulation. It is a negotiation. This is what many find quite difficult to really understand because, you know, my view is that it is regulation. It's not traditional regulation, right? It is not the regulator just gathering the whole information and describing what the deal needs to look like and the price and the terms need to be because that is traditional regulation. But it is regulation to the extent that there is a policy decision being made that there needs to be a transfer from this cohort to this cohort, and they need to talk. Yes, they need to talk and describe what the number needs to be in the negotiation between them, but they wouldn't do so spontaneously. And in, to that extent, it is regulation. Regulation is the fact that they are essentially putting a rule to negotiate. That's regulation to me. No, you don't see it like that. No, no, no. no. I, I didn't say it wasn't regulation, Christina. I, I, I think I, you, you missed. I mean, I, I understand why I you misunderstood. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I can see why you did because I was a bit unclear. But no, definitely regulation. I mean, the Sherman Act is regulation. I mean, you know, antitrust law is regulation. Uh, anything the government does when it passes a law is regulation. No, no, it's clearly regulation. What I was responding to was someone. One of the commentators uh, earlier said that. Had the ACCC had full information, then we could have just intervened and set the price. And be, and I said, no, no, we were never intending to do that. We were never intending. And this is where I right. I deliberately misspoke. I mean, I inadvertently misspoke. And I said, you know, we, we never intended to regulate the sector. What I should have said, we never intended to regulate the sector in that way. So, yes, this exactly. is regulation, unambiguously regulation, with the sole objective, though, of even up the bargaining power and it was not intended to do anything else, but definitely regulation. Perfect. Okay, let me pass uh, on, move on to Paul, and then we'll go back to you, Rod, in the discussion later. So, Paul, um, as I understand it, and, and, and uh, it's all there to see the press in Canada ask Parliament to pass a law effectively similar to the Australian one. The Prime Minister gave its support, the government gave its support. Uh, I, I, I've seen you speak to Parliament and essentially support the idea that, that the Australian model is simple, it does not involve taxpayer money, um, and so you are uh, discussing at this point uh, in the House of Commons, as I understand it, the uh, so-called Online News Act, or C18, and I must say I've followed some of the, the position of the various interested parties, some extraordinary scenes there. I've seen uh, some extraordinary claims. And of course, in the bigger debate, there have been threats also in Canada on the part of platforms to essentially black out news. So it's interesting to hear from you where, where things are and, and where, you think they, where you think they will be going. Great, uh, thank you, Christina. It's a great pleasure to uh, to be with you and uh, and with Rod and uh, and Louis and everyone else here today. Um, first, let me say that you know from our perspective, you know, real journalism that, that is honest, accurate, and fair and balanced, it costs real money, and to create that quality content, we must be commercially viable. So, 
you know, we started down this path uh, probably about five years ago. This is well before I joined News Media Canada. And to figure out sort of how do we uh, get properly compensated for the value that we bring to the big tech platforms. So the, the question was really, how do we do it? And I guess, you know, the first approach, which is probably the simplest, would be just to tax the platforms, put the money in a fund, and then you know, redistribute. The, the problem that we had with that is we wanted to be on a commercial footing, uh, a level playing field with the platforms, and we really didn't want much in the way of government intervention. So, so that, from our perspective, really wasn't a workable solution. The, the next one was through copyright legislation, but as we looked at it, that we just felt that that would be very long and complex, you know, potentially an eight or 10 year uh, activity. And, you know, just in terms of where the industry is at, that, uh, that that wouldn't have been viable either. And then the third one was to provide a waiver under the uh, the Competition Act. So, so during the uh, summer election in Canada in 2021, uh, a number of the parties came out uh, with positions on this issue. The Liberal Party, which was the governing party heading into the election and the governing party post the election, they proposed the Australian model. And that was something that we had been pushing for and felt that of all of the various options that, uh, that it was the best. I guess just sort of stepping back in terms of sort of why is this legislation needed, uh, we asked Polaro, which is a leading uh, Canadian uh, research firm, to survey Canadians just in terms of their own views on, on news and what to do. So over 90% thought that it was important that local news survive, and 80% of Canadians felt that, you know, legislation was needed. So as, as we looked at this, you know, we know that there's a significant imbalance between the platforms and the tech giants, uh, or sorry, between the platforms and the news outlets. And, you know, to give you a perspective, the, I, I haven't looked recently, but if, at one point, the combined market cap of Google and Meta was about three quarters of Canada's annual GDP. So these are, these are massive companies. And with the prospect of, of Parliament uh, taking action, Google and Meta both started doing deals uh, with Canadian publishers, mainly with large Canadian publishers, although not with all. So they did deals with about a dozen or so publishers. The problem with that, although you know we're definitely happy for these publishers that they're being compensated for their content, but the problem with that is we to, we started getting sort of more of a situation of haves and have-nots amongst Canadian publishers. So the smaller publishers, frankly, and even a lot of the mid-publishers and even some large publishers were left out in the cold. And that, that was a real problem. With the legislation, essentially what it does is, as Rod mentioned, it allows us to negotiate uh, collectively. Currently, our Competition uh, Act actually prohibits us from coming together to negotiate. So, so, you know, we have a strong belief that if we come together, we'll be in a better position and we'll be in a much stronger bargaining position if we're together. It also includes an enforcement mechanism, uh, baseball style final offer arbitration, where if it ever gets to arbitration, uh, you know, the arbitrator would pick sort of one side or the other. So it encourages both parties to really put their best offer forward. And then again, as, as Rod mentioned, you know, looking to the Australian example, it's working. Uh, you know, we've seen north of $200 million uh, flow from platforms to news organizations. And, you know, one of the interesting things and we've talked to uh, pretty much everyone who's negotiated a content licensing agreement in Australia, but the smaller publishers, you know, like Country Press Australia, for example, uh, which is, I think, about 160 titles. And then there was also a group of ethnic and LGBTQ publications, uh, about two dozen that came together. And they did very uh, well, although in the case of the, the latter, they were able to do a deal uh, with Google, but uh, but no uh, no apparent interest from uh, from Meta. So as we as we looked to Canada in our legislation, you know, we we looked carefully at the Australian legislation and we thought, what can we do to improve upon that? So there are a number of uh, innovations uh, in the Canadian legislation that I think build on the you know the great work that uh, that Rod and his colleague, colleagues in the Australian government did. So first of all, the the determination as to you know which platforms are subject to the act uh, in Australia that's made by the minister, and in Canada it's made by the CRTC, which is our communications uh, regulator. So there's you know 
further removal of political involvement or pol potential political interference in the Canadian legislation. The, the entitlement for re remuneration is also clear in our act. So it refers to fair compensation for news content that is made available. So we feel that that's important. There's also um, uh, a, a clause in ours, which said that an appropriate portion of the remuneration will be used by the news business to produce news content. So again, we feel that's important that, you know, some of the criticisms uh, of, uh, that Rod had mentioned of the Australian uh, code was that, you know, potentially this, you know, isn't being reinvested in journalism, although frankly, the evidence is clearly there in Australia. Uh, and again, in terms of the, you know, the hiring environment in Australia uh, has, has improved dramatically since, uh, since the code came in. The other, uh, I think, differentiation from the Australian legislation is the, our legislation contains a specific exemption from our Competition Act, whereas the Australian legislation is actually quiet on that point. Um, the Canadian legislation also provides for greater transparency, and it gives the CRTC, our communications regulator, uh, extensive powers in order to uh, obtain information. Uh, and none of this is in the Australian legislation. So, for example, there'll be a annual report which is produced by the CRTC. It will refer to, uh, you know, numbers in aggregate in terms of, uh, you know, compensation that has flowed from uh, from the big tech platforms to the publishers. It, as we looked at uh, this in approaching collective negotiation, you know, we feel that a lot of the, uh, or at least some of the larger publishers will likely you know, continue to do their own deals. Um, but we have many small publishers, both within our own organization and also with the National Ethnic Media and Press Council. And so what we basically decided in terms of approaching collective negotiation that would really be based on everyone's proportionate investment in their newsroom, and then we would sort of figure out, you know, compensation on a per title, uh, out, uh, per title basis, based on their proportionate investment in, in newsroom. So we think that C-18 overall is good legislation. I mean, no legislation is perfect, um, but it can be made better. And so from where it was first introduced in the uh, parliament about a year ago, we proposed a number of amendments and specifically um, the, the, the criteria, there was basically uh, two criteria in terms of eligibility of publishers. The first one followed sort of a set of uh, criteria which is used to determine eligibility for a labor tax credit in Canada. But then the second one was, in our view, far too vague. So it basically said that you had to have two employees, but it wasn't clear, for example, you know, could uh, family members who aren't arm's length, could they be, if they, if they are journalists, could they be considered employees? So we got that language clarified. There was also with that two journalists minimum standard, there, it really didn't say anything about editorial standards. So, you know, we pushed for language on that and, uh, and Google did as well. And I think we've got much better language on that now. The other part was there was, uh, there was no sort of shot clock or timeline around negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. So what we had proposed is that in all three cases, it be 45 days. Now, what the government came back, or at least the House of Commons, how they amended the bill just before Christmas was it was 90 days for negotiation, 120 for mediation, and 45 for arbitration. So the bill currently is before, uh, is before our Senate, and I expect will begin uh, Senate hearings into the bill probably within the next two, two to three weeks. And when that comes back, one of, we're going to propose a number of amendments. Uh, one will be, again, tightening that shot clock back to kind of the 45, 45, 45 to make sure that this isn't a protracted uh, process. And then the other one is just tightening up some language around the powers of the CRTC. Uh, you know, we want government as far away from newsrooms as possible. And, uh, you know, obviously editorial uh, independence is, is paramount. So just making sure that, you know, they only need the information that they need to produce this annual report in terms of sort of aggregate information, but, you know, per publisher or per title basis, uh, that, you know, there's no need for them to uh, to have that information from our perspective. So, um, you know, it's it's great to see other countries uh, now following and, you know, Rod mentioned some of them that are, are looking at uh, similar codes. And we're obviously very excited to see the JCPA 
uh, you know, reintroduced uh, in the United States. I, I think from our perspective, you know, looking at the industry on a go forward basis, these content licensing agreements are obviously very important, but they're not a silver bullet. They're not going to solve all of the problems and challenges that the industry has, which are, which are many. Um, I'll give you just a couple of examples, but the government of Canada, uh, they spent last year, I believe, $140 million in advertising, which was probably about triple from what their normal spend would be. They obviously ramped it up in the last couple of years with the uh, need to get out healthcare information related to COVID. But of the $140 million, only $6 million went to print advertising, uh, which you know we think is ridiculous. And that's that's you know, newspapers, that's ethnic media uh, papers, that's magazines. So, you know, from our perspective, that's uh, that's not sufficient. And I guess lastly, you know, publishers are really going to have to address this digital transformation, which, you know, some are certainly doing better than others, but it's a massive challenge. But we want to make sure that these monies from Google and Meta are, renego are, are reinvested back in newsrooms, because as we move from an advertising-based model to a subscription-based model, it's critical that people invest in content. And I think one of the lessons of the last dozen years or so uh, for you know all newspapers is you cannot cut your way to growth. You have to invest in your product, and and that's what people will pay for. So you know we're 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 you know excited about the legislation. We think that the stipulation in the legislation that it's reinvested back in the business is important. And, you know, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, sort of an end to the kind of death by a thousand cuts in uh, in the Canadian news business and just start to reinvest back in, in our product. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Uh, let me just ask you a couple of follow-ups before moving on to Luis. So, What's interesting and exciting about what you describe is effectively in a world in which we are experimenting with regulation, you have had the benefit of watching the Australian experience unfold and effectively seeking to improve on it uh, in, to the extent that it's, it's possible. And you listed a number of ways in which you think you've closed some gaps and possibly uh, taken things further. So that's interesting, and I will want to hear what Rod uh, thinks of these uh, developments and improvements. But give us a sense, because your discussions are still ongoing. You said that the bill is going to be in front of the Senate in a couple of weeks. It's not yet law. The impression from abroad is that there's, there's uh, another example of significant resistance to use an understatement by the platforms. I've seen uh people testify there's an open letter by google there's threats what is the what has been the response and how do you see that uh unfolding on the part of the platforms are they so, going to play in the end uh so, how is it going to play so so i i think the more heavy-handed tactics uh frankly i think that's backfired uh you know our parliamentarians have gotten their back up uh, on some of these tactics. And we, you know, we've seen a number of things. And it's, it's interesting because as we spoke to uh, folks in Australia, they basically sort of walk through the playbook on these companies. And it's basically playing out, uh, you know, on a pretty similar basis in Canada. So I don't think that has worked, frankly. And I, I think as, as we sort of near the finish line, and we're hoping that this legislation will be passed you know, at some point in in May or June, as we get closer to the finish line, I, I you know, what we would say to uh, to the platforms is, you know, work with us. Let's be constructive. If you have specific concerns about the legislation that don't gut, you know, the fundamental tenets of the of the of the legislation, which are, you know, the ability of publishers to come together collectively and then backed up by the teeth of final off, offer arbitration. As long as those central tenets are there, you know, we're open to to dialogue with them. So, you know, our, our message to them would be, you know, focus on improving the bill if you have specific improvements. But some of these tactics, I I think it's a distraction, frankly, for for them, and and uh, and certainly the reaction from parliamentarians has not been positive. Yeah, I, I, I've seen some pretty exasperated parliamentarians uh, on the news. Thanks for that, Paul. We'll go back to this uh, later, but uh, I wanted to now, and thank you for your patience, Louis, uh, go to you um, and really uh, 
talk about what has been a very different approach, right? Um, in, in France, uh, Google, and you'll tell us about it, uh, signed an agreement with the Alliance for the General Information Press, which is a news group um, which, which involves a number of, of publishers for a framework for individual negotiation of, as I understand it, licensing agreement with certified publishers for the right to display the content online. So this, as I understand it again, is founded in the uh, EU directive of 2019, which talked about things called neighboring rights, and that has been the foundation for the French approach. France has adopted the provisions of that directive. So talk to us about the French approach, how it differs from the bargaining code. Why do you think France went that way? What do you think the merits are of this approach, the benefits, and, and, and how it compares to a bargaining code? Thank you. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to um, contribute to this discussion. Um, I would say that, uh, first of all, we were lucky enough to have to benefit from double pressure of the European Commission and the French government to um, defend um, law uh, pushing neighboring rights on the agenda, both of the Commission and on the French uh, Parliament. Uh, in terms of bargaining codes, what struck me was uh, three types of difficulties. The first one was with Google with their fear of uh, what I would call a domino effect, meaning everything that the French publishers would uh, get and would, um, would uh, publicize would mean for them an additional risk in other countries. For the French, on the French publisher side, I would say that the, um, the difficulty was the unbalanced um, forces between Google and the French publishers. And very rapidly, the French publisher behaved like if Google will, would be, will be able to um, pay for um, the losses for the past few years. So very, very soon in the discussion, the French um, editors I have to say, uh, made uh, unrealistic demands to Google. And the third thing that struck me was the difficulty of the French government, uh, probably because of the lack of expertise, to help us in the negotiation and in uh, finding the right data and the right uh, um, KPI to uh, lead this discussion. So after a few months of discussion, um, L'Alliance, which is um, a group of um, the group of the French main uh, daily publishers, uh, um, were um, uh, went nowhere with no um, chance of finding uh, a deal with Google. And at the moment, at this moment of time, it was uh, two summers ago. Uh, with Le Monde and with my shareholders, we um, took the responsibility of um, having um, solitary negotiation with Google, but knowing two things. First, uh, Le Monde as the main French publisher had enough weight to get um, a deal with Google, meaning Google needed a deal with Le Monde. And the second thing is, since um, I was going to negotiate a fair share of this deal with my journalist, I told Google from scratch that I would make this deal public. So I, I, I knew that whatever deal I will find with Google, my um, uh, fellow publishers could use it to have the same kind of negotiation. And that's what happened, that we, we found a deal um, in September 2021, um, 20, I would say. And um, a few months later, L'Alliance found the same deal. So that was um, 
uh, I think the outcome went quite well, but uh, for two things that the French publishers needed to have um, more resources to invest in this uh, transformation of the business model and Google needed a deal with France to make sure that uh, um, threats that were um, uttered by the, uh, the European Commission could decrease quite rapidly. So that's in, that was the context. And the, uh, I heard from um, Paul uh, just, just before an interesting things, uh, an interesting suggestion that meaning that in the, in the law, uh, maybe it would be a good idea to make sure that these additional resources go to um, additional investment in the newsroom, not to shareholders. And I, I obviously I'm, I'm completely, I completely agree with this suggestion, we uh, at Le Monde are quite special because we never um, send dividends to our shareholders. It's a deal that we have with our shareholders. All our uh, profits are going back to the dual forces. So that's what we use um, Google Money for. But uh, it would make sense to um, make sure by the law that these additional resources goes to either um, additional news resources or text resources, because what we have in front of us is quite still quite challenging. Um, what we saw in France is uh, the only business model that is liable for us uh, depend on uh, digital subscriptions and for to get subscribers on digital, we, we need to have quite um, important editorial resources. And that for that, we need uh, Google and Facebook money. So that's the context in France. Uh, those, um, this law and this agreement are uh, uh, two years old. And um, it's a three-year deal that will be renewed, I believe, in the next, uh, in the next year for a few more years. So it's, it's important on French markets. At Le Monde level, it doesn't change our business model, but it's, um, it's, uh, it helped us do two things. Uh, first, um, uh, get additional resources. And as you may know, according to French law, we are supposed to find deal with our trade unions to uh, distribute a fair share, as uh, the law say, of these revenues to the um, uh, journalists. So that's a current negotiation in France, and it will be a way to um, increase the salaries of our uh, journalists. And it's uh, in this um, inflationist contest, it's a good opportunity. Okay, so. So, so Louis, to follow up on that, can you explain to the audience a little bit more how in substance your approach, which is based around copyright, differs from what is done in Australia and what's contemplated in Canada? How does it differ? It's still a negotiation over a payment. I, 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 think, it, I think it doesn't, uh, I, I'm not sure there's a difference. It's a negotiation. Okay. We 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 found it KPI, meaning it was in terms of a number of journalists, number of contents, and the audience, the volume of the audience. Uh, we negotiate a fair share of revenues, and that's we we found deals. So I'm I'm not sure there's a huge difference. Okay. The, we we thought that to, to be the first country to lead this negotiation was an edge for us. So we played it, and to be the first publisher in the France in the first country was um, another edge. And so Le Monde was leading on this negotiation, but I'm not sure there's a huge difference with Australia. Okay, so so you're right. It was the first in Europe. It failed, as I understand it, in Germany and in Spain. Why do you think it failed over there and it succeeded in France? It, um, my, uh, I believe that because the leading publishing group in Germany has decided 
that uh, Google proposal would be um, too low, and that they prefer, uh, they prefer to refuse the deal. And the leading publisher in France, meaning Le Monde, decided that there was an opportunity to find a deal with Google. Maybe they are, um, and I would say, I think it's Springer, they are much bigger than I am, and so they can afford to refuse <laughs> any deal Google wants. But I would say that um, uh, it's not a bad idea to be pragmatic and to find deals with this platform. Those platforms have huge resources in terms of investment. They know how to reach a larger audience. We need a larger audience. We need a younger generation of users. I need to find deals with those platforms. So what's super interesting is how you alluded to it a moment ago, talking about, we talk about the share of revenue. We look at number of journalists. We look at readership. Tell us a bit more how these negotiations, what are the, the general parameters? This feels like it's a commercial negotiation and obviously don't give us the numbers or the details, but how does one actually negotiate? What do you base the number on? Because one says 100 and one says two. So how do you come to somewhere where you agree on the basis of what? Um, that's why you cannot be too many around the tables because your um, interests or your KPI will be different. Dealing um, on behalf of Le Monde was easier for me. I knew how much I wanted and what could be significant for me or what would be much too low for me to strike a deal. But it's a negotiation. And so I cannot say much more about that. But uh, let me tell you that if, uh, and, and Julia, know that uh, by experience, if we sign a deal, that means it was good for the moment. <laughs> okay, and and but what, what so but but you're saying it's good for the moment. What about the tale of smaller publishers? You said that the fact that you made your agreement public helped probably the alliance, uh, the alliance to do their deal on behalf of a broader group. I would say that if Le Monde hadn't find a, hadn't, hadn't struck a deal with Google, there would be no deal in France for a few years. And so the smallest publishers probably regret the time I went on my own to deal with Google. But the truth is they benefit from this deal because then Google, knowing that I would um, uh, made public, I would made public this deal needed to find the same kind of deal with uh, smaller publishers. But Google was also fined 500 millions along the way, no? For failing to negotiate in good faith um, yeah. with publishers. What happened there? What happened there? But then then they, they found a deal. But they, knowing that they found a deal with me, but not with smaller publishers, and that since I made the deal public, and they were um, they got this uh, fine. They had to um, to comply and find the same deal. And uh, Google was quite um, uh, fast in dealing with a smaller publisher afterwards. Let me just turn to Rod and to Paul and ask you to comment on the French approach. I mean, fascinating to hear from you, Louise. Uh, and clearly, you were a pioneer in this. But Rod, what do you see as the differences between what happened in France and what happened in Australia and, and what do you think of, of, of these differences? Thanks, Christina. Uh, I might just correct one thing that Paul said, if I could, and it is relevant. The collective bargaining was in our legislation. Um, and in any event, uh, we authorised two collective bargaining deals. Um, uh, so very much part of what we were doing. I guess, um, well, we didn't go copyright uh, simply because we felt it was hard to define and hard to price. But I, I think what Louis is saying, that that really that copyright legislation was some sort of threat that deals had to be done and um, uh, the intervention of the French Competition Authority saw deals done with others. I, I guess we felt that the the better way to improve the bargaining power rather than have the threat of further fines from the competition authority where it's not quite clear 
to the competition authority what represents just payment, we felt the better uh, threat, if you like, was arbitration, final offer arbitration. So um, that really does even up the bargaining power. Google can't um, uh, just refuse to deal with you or if the media company feels that they've got a poor deal, they can go to arbitration. So I think our approach does increase the bargaining power of the media companies more than the French approach. But uh, I accept that different people have different views on that. And again, just going back to what Paul said about our code, uh, he calls them improvements. I don't, but that's fine. Uh, different <laughs> people have different uh, different different uh, views on these things. Uh, as long as media gets good good payment, that's all we're interested in here. So uh, you will be you will notice that I did not call them improvement. I talked about development because I yep. knew that you would you would not necessarily agree with the word. But maybe yep. maybe before I turn to Paul, I mean, maybe it's useful for you to just spend a minute towards the end of this discussion to just illustrate why the final offer arbitration was such. We talked about it as if it is as if it is a uh, you know something that is known to everybody. Uh, but it does have particular properties that are unique and that make it desirable in these circumstances. But maybe not everybody knows what final offer means. And maybe you can describe why it appealed to you and, uh, and, and how it works. Yeah. So in a, in a normal commercial arbitration, if I could use that term, both sides would uh, present their offers. Um, the arbitrator would determine what it felt the arbitrator felt was the right outcome. Uh, the problem here is that the arbitrator has got no knowledge. Uh, and what we knew was going to happen if it had been commercial negotiation, as I think you applied in your introduction, uh, Christina, the media companies would have asked for, you know, a billion dollars. Uh, one of them talked about that being the total amount. And the platforms would have said, no, no, you owe us $200 million. Now, the arbitrator has just can't do anything with that range of outcomes and has no knowledge to come up with a better number. So the idea of final offer arbitration is that both parties put in their best offer or their view about what the outcome should be. And the arbitrator is restricted to only going with one or the other. Uh, now we did give the arbitrator just a little bit of flexibility, which is not terribly relevant here. Uh, but the point is, you had to come up with a reasonable offer. So, you know, if the media companies were sitting there saying, well, actually, we know a billion dollars ridiculous, and they had come in at, you know, 300 million, um, and and uh, Google and Facebook were still saying, no, no, you owe us 200 million. Well, you know, 300 million would have been the number. So it forces both sides to come up with something that is realistic. Uh, and that's that at least gives the arbitrator a good starting point, whereas without that, the arbitrator would have been in a very difficult position. Indeed, and um, so uh, and, and 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 just to mention, this is something that comes originally also. I mean, it's found also in things like discussions of uh, standard essential patent when you need to find a fund rate. It has uh, quite a, a pedigree over there. So um, I wanted to turn to Paul for uh, a final few comments on what you heard from Luis, from, from, from the challenge from Rod, that he, your changes are not necessarily an improvement. I'm sure that you will take it uh, in the good spirit, but let's hear from you on, on a couple of final comments. Sure. So I'll, I'll change it from uh, from improvements to tweaks because we stand on the shoulders <laughs> of the giant and that giant is, is Rod Sims. And we certainly thank him for all the great work that he's done. Um, look, we, you know, as we look to the various models, uh, you know, our preference in Canada was Australia's news media bargaining code. Uh, we think it works for us. Uh, we've got a great need to get this done uh, quickly, uh, you know, with appropriate parliamentary review. Uh, and so we think that it's it's really an ideal model. We've talked to other publishers throughout the Americas, and I know they're very excited about it. And they really hope that, you know, Canada gets the Online News Act, that the U.S. moves forward with the JCPA, and then that this will follow throughout the Americas. You know, it's it's easy to sit in, you know, France or Australia or, or Canada and, you know, think about, uh, you know, sort of journalism and, you know, we've got 
high levels of you know freedom in terms of journalists and all that but when you think about the americas and some other parts of the world um you know a, a bunch of these countries are more challenged and so for you know and their publishers face sim similar financial pressures so to get this type of legislation throughout the world we think of it really as a democracy enhancing activity and again I, I just can't say enough in terms of the great work that rod and his colleagues have done in australia it's really been the model from our perspective and uh we're excited and we hope that this legislation will uh pass before our summer starts Wonderful. We are at the end. I want to pass on uh, to Tommaso and Julia for wrapping up and, and saying goodbye. I'll just close this particular panel thanking the speakers. We have some real giants here. Uh, I mean, Rod absolutely is, is uh, uh, absolutely a giant who has led in this field and many more to come, Rod. And of course, Paul doing fantastic work in Canada and Louis leading uh, a major French publisher who has really been a pioneer in implementing all of this. So I think that to complement the academic discussion with this policy discussion was a privilege. I will uh, thank you again and pass on to Tommaso and Julia for the for the general wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to all the panelists. I should also mention that Rod not only is legendary, he's also the chairman of the RPN on competition policy of the CPR RPN. So we are delighted to have him on board. And I want to thank CPR for hosting us, uh, especially uh, Elise Chrétien. And since uh, Julia started, I want her also to finish with the goodbyes. But thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for participating in this uh, event. I really think that we uh, learned a lot, like both from the first and the second part. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, the, the the next uh, the next workshops and meetings. And I hope, like with uh, Tommaso, we will also like do more things together because I, I guess we cannot really think uh, about uh, regulating the media industry uh, without uh, working on uh, competition policy. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, see you very soon. Thank you.